Are we ready? Election 2019, you'll be sorry. So, Robert, what we're going to do is have a lovely Christmas tree because this is a festive election okay. around which the nation has joyfully gathered for the last few right. weeks. Remember that, joy? So here we Someone go. Someone told me about it once. <laughs> So here's our Christmas tree. That is a good Christmas tree. Thank you. No, that is... You see? Definitely yeah. a very good Christmas tree. Yeah. So the question <coughs> is, on this festive election, what are the presents under the tree? What sort of voter patterns could adorn the victory of one party or the other? And who's going to end up in pole position yeah. as fairy on the top of the tree? Yes. OK? OK. So... So starting with the presents, then. Yeah. What did you have in mind? So, obviously, the biggest present that... Conservative supporters want is Brexit delivered. Let's just get it done, OK? Let's just get it, <laughs> let's just get it done. Yeah. Spooky. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have some people over here for this whom... Brexit, let's not get it done, presumably. Yeah, so we've got some Orange Lib Dems and some Red Labour Party people. That's the biggest present under the tree. No Brexit. And the SNP, no, but that's, of course. Sorry, that's not the Labour position. The Labour position is... It could be Brexit still, or it could not be Brexit. OK, so in fact... Mystery Brexit. So when you open the Labour Party box... Yes. ..one of two things could be inside yes. it. It's about several options. It is a mystery Brexit. Again, and let's do a little... This let's... is not the Brexit I ordered online. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you keep the receipt? <laughs> um, and here's the SNP also wanting no... Yep. Brexit. But what else? What else? What else? So well, should we have a... The end of austerity is the big... Oh, yeah, OK. Everybody is promising the end of austerity, but okay. there is a Tory end of austerity, which is probably sort of quite a small present. Yes. And then there is a Labour end of austerity, which is enormous. Yeah, um, a great big bow on it. Yes. There is a Lib Dem end of austerity, which is bigger than the Tory one, <laughs> but smaller than the Labour one, of course. OK, I'll put it here. Three bears end yep. of austerity. OK, there we go. <clears throat> I'll have that one in. Now, I must admit, at the start of this election, I thought environmental policies were going to be one of the big concentrating issues and defining issues of the contest. They are, in terms of the debate, the dog that hasn't really barked all that much, which isn't to say that it won't affect voters, right. uh, particularly younger voters, when they come to the polls. And for those who are most agitated about the environment, the Labour Party are offering undoubtedly the biggest goodie. Yeah. They are essentially promising to decarbonise the economy by around 2030. 2030 is not a hard and fast date, yeah. but the way they're talking is to achieve the bulk of the decarbonisation by 2030. Lib Dems, I think, it's 2045, and the, the Tories are 2050. It's a bit weird, actually, <clears throat> I think, that the whole conversation about the environment and about the climate emergency has become a bit of a bidding war on dates. Yes. Like, my date's earlier than yours as if there are no other yes. issues Although, about making these huge when, changes to the economy. When Boris Johnson talks about what, it... He... What's my symbol? What's, am I doing another present for this? What's the um, Extinction Rebellion logo? Is it that oh, sort of... Let's yeah. do a bauble. Let's a do bauble, an XR yes. bauble. Here we go. We'll have a couple of them okay, over here. Presumably and... super glued to the tree. <laughs> yes, that's right. No, no, the elves have super glued <laughs> themselves to the tree. Yeah. And here's a, here's a little Tory Extinction Rebellion one as well, because everybody wants to be on this turf. Um, interestingly, Boris Johnson, whenever he talks about the environment, he's much more interested in talking about endangered species than he is about humanity as an endangered species. He's talking about protection of rhinos and wild animals and also a little bit about electric cars. He, he doesn't talk about the environment as a cohesive major issue. But it's interesting, that, because actually the, the <coughs> Conservative Party's attempts to kind of green themselves over the last few years, which there was a lot of that under Michael Gove, it does have a heritage, right, because it's conservation. Conservation, yeah. So, in a, in a sense, you can sort of... You can have a Tory green agenda that's more about that. Of course, the Labour green agenda is more about completely restructuring the economy. So, they both have different versions of this environmentalism. Yeah, I mean... It's, and the it, Green Party's a bit irritated because they're still stuck on 3 to 4%. Yes. And they're like, we were here first, yeah. we were here first, which I mean, is It is sad. interesting, and the Conservatives... I mean, when Boris Johnson took over as leader. He did actually push Tory environmentalists into key jobs around the environment. So, Theresa Villiers, who was a big figure in the Conservative Environmental Group, Zach Goldsmith, another big figure in the Conservative Environmental Group, they were both given jobs in the environment space yeah. to push this forward. And I think Boris Johnson thinks of himself in this way. Unfortunately, both Theresa Villiers and Zach Goldsmith are two of the most threatened MPs in this election. So it would be interesting to see how green the Tories were if they stay in power but lose those figures. There's no question it's an issue that hasn't dominated the debate as much as it perhaps no, could have I done. No, I thought it would do, particularly because at the beginning of the campaign, it looked as if it was the prism through which 
the Labour Party wanted its economic plans to be seen. I mean, they yes. still talk about it. They talk about the Green New Deal echoing the American Democrats, but it's not been as loud a conversation. And that is because so much of the domestic policy conversation has been about the NHS. Yes. So I would say that inside this huge Labour Party spending present, or, or possibly possibly like there's a more there's like a whole pile of, of presence of what it actually means but I think that I think that the you know the issue of how much money the NHS gets and also staffing the NHS post Brexit well, I mean, I has really come to dominate. The difficult question I think for Labour when they look back at this election if it doesn't go the right way for them is the extent to which they sprayed out promises everywhere and to the extent to which that obscured <laughs> the messages they really wanted to make, or whether they hit the right target. So, for example, yeah. the pledge to um, look after the WASPy women, that was after all the other pledges. On the other hand, if you're one of the WASPy women, that's going down quite well. The pledge on tuition fees goes down quite well. Both of these policies are not quite as progressive as some of the other things they could be doing. They're sort of spraying different that's camps right. and that's seeing right. if we can build up a collection of policies. The danger is people look at it all and go, it's just not going to happen, you're not going to do it. What you have traditionally and clearly the polling reflects this very, very dramatically, is that you have, you have younger voters. This is, this is a sort of trail of mm. younger voters. They absolutely love the Labour Party. They love the Labour policies, as you've said, free tuition, all the rest of it. And the, uh, this, is, this is strings yeah. of voters. OK, all right, yes. <laughs> and then you've got... That's exactly what I thought. When is I that, is that yeah. what you thought? <laughs> and then you've got the older age groups who skew really dramatically every few years you go up the age yeah, yeah. scale you've got this <clears throat> m much thicker tinsel of tor you know tory tinsel which is older vo older voters and but that waspy women pledge i thought was extremely interesting from the labor party because they're clearly trying to send at least some of these pensioners Oh, Red, I mean, but this, will it work? This is undoubtedly one of the really interesting um tussles for policymakers in elections yeah. which is it's well known that older voters are more likely to vote, they're likely to turn out, and that they are ferociously protective of their benefits. Even people who really don't need some of the benefits, the so-called pensions triple lock, you know, the, yeah. the winter fuel allowance, things like that. Yeah. Which the Conservative Party have said they will save to you guarantee know, All sides income. are yeah. promising to keep all these policies, to not have any means testing along this line, while promising significant amounts of spending elsewhere. And the electoral logic of this is clear. On the other hand, if you are trying to say that policy has been too skewed mm. to older voters and not focused enough on younger voters, it's a very curious way of going about it. Because if you're saying we don't have enough houses for the young, we don't have enough economic prospects for the young, you know, we're hitting them with debt on tuition fees and such like, you shouldn't be wasting money. I mean, wasting's a bit harsh, but you shouldn't be focusing so much money yeah. on other groups, some of whom don't need it. Now, with the Labour Party... So that's the voting chart, right? Yeah. So, so you've got enormous numbers of young people yep. voting Labour, enormous numbers of older people voting Tory, and then there's a crossover here yeah. in the in And the, the problem 40s. for the Tories is that that red line is moving up there, That's so right. it's getting worse and worse for the There's a demographic reckoning coming their way if they don't sort themselves out. But, you know, yeah. I, I do think for the Labour Party, this is an easier position, especially if you are promising almost limitless spending, because their philosophical outlook is they want universal benefits, they believe yeah. in them, that actually there should be a common floor which everyone is entitled to a common set of benefits and a common set of values. The Conservatives don't take that view on lots of things, therefore their position about not means testing is much harder to explain. I'm going to add some <coughs> houses as okay. decorations on the Labour yes. side because actually you mentioned housing policy and the Labour pledge is really quite extreme in terms of house building and also social housing. Social house building, yeah. And the Tory party, interestingly, under Mrs May, had promised a lot more housing, partly to try mm. and tempt in some of these younger groups that they desperately need if they're going to build a different voter base in the future, right, beyond yeah, yeah. this election. But actually, this Conservative manifesto goes back to not quite as many and also with an emphasis on private ownership, not on social housing. So yeah. it's sort of less on that. But it's a huge, huge issue. I mean, some would argue it's actually the policy priority that all the parties should well, be I mean, I don't talking about because it affects social mobility, it affects yeah. where your workforce can travel to and whether it's they can. Children moving far from their families, etc. I, mean, I, I agree with you totally, and I think particularly for the Conservatives, it seems to me baffling that a party which is built around the belief that pe once people get assets, 
and a stake yeah. in society, they will turn conservative. Yeah. That you are not spending a lot of time thinking about how to give these people a, a stake in society. And, I mean, you touched on this, I think, correctly. It's quite ironic that actually Theresa May's manifesto yeah. was much more effectively targeted at the so-called red wall of voters that Boris Johnson is going after. Because it is, it is about, give, was about giving more opportunities to, to people who have been left behind in the economic success of the last 20 years. Boris Johnson simply has pushed out almost any... Yeah. Any concrete policy that doesn't need to be there. But of course, in the middle of the 2017 campaign, Mrs. May's whole efforts to re-establish, yeah. uh, you know, a stronger majority of the Tories was exploded by having in the manifesto this pledge on funding social care, which became known yes. as the dementia tax, and that's put the Tory party off possibly ever trying to tackle this. Subject of intergenerational, exactly. I mean, in fairness, ever again, they're right? just dodging it again in this manifest. They say yeah. they're going to have a, a, a attempt to find cross-party view on it. We'll, we'll see, but they certainly weren't putting it in the manifesto. Although, from what I understand, they do think sort of know what they're going to do. They just don't want to tell us yet, which is oh, obviously is that tre right? tremendously encouraging. Oh, news. Great, marvelous, marvelous. I think you wanted to sort of bring up the idea that there might be some sort of Christmas ghost right. hanging okay. about. Some so I'm that, going to attempt to draw a Christmas so... ghost. Okay, go for and it. Said, thereby, as usual, validating why you do all the drawing and I do very little of it. And it isn't because I'm lazy, it's because I'm rubbish <laughs> at drawing ghosts. So I'm going to talk all this one social care, in fact. Okay. Because it's the dog that didn't bark or so the, this ghost to me, that, the ghost that didn't go woo. <laughs> tactical voting oh, is yes. by far and away the biggest ghost, especially if you're Boris Johnson, the biggest spectre haunting the Conservatives yeah. at the moment. The polls have not in a major way moved throughout this election. The Conservatives got themselves up to about 42, 43% of the vote, roughly where Theresa May was, consolidated the Leave vote, and they haven't really shifted. Their vote has not gone down. The major story of the campaign has been the extent to which Labour has squeezed the Liberal Democrat vote, and it's got it down from around 16, 17% at the start of the campaign to, various polls put it, between 12 and 11% now. Because the, the mystery Brexit <coughs> present yeah. has proved enough <laughs> to tempt people to, to take the big, shiny package, not the very clear no Brexit, but with less yes, chance of making a difference. but also just the brutal realities of the first-past-the-post yeah. post system and where the Lib Dems are. What the Conservative strategy has been, as we've discussed a number of times, is to take the seats in the north from Labour, which are Levy, and there's quite a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that they're succeeding in this, mm. and then just hold the line as much as they can in the south, give up as few seats as possible. That's the path to victory. And... In terms of the way they're structuring their campaign, you would have to say that the Conservatives have done what they intended to do. We don't know if it's worked, but in terms of the structure of the campaign, they have run the campaign they wanted to run. Mm. And, and they've learnt from both 2015 and 2017 when uh, the last 10 days of the campaign mm -hmm. involved telling a lot of voters who might be wavering between voting Conservative and Lib Dem down in the south, mm -hmm. in the southern seats, that it's not safe to because look who's the Labour leader. And that, unfortunately, for the other parties, works yeah. quite, quite well. There's been a last-minute attempt to try and persuade Lib Dems to vote Labour and Labour to vote Lib Dems, depending where they live. Yeah. But actually, what I think has happened is that's drawn attention to a lot of problems with the tactical voting as much as it's encouraged people to do so. And I have certainly noticed a lot of people saying, how dare you try and morally blackmail me? to vote the other way, Labour or Lib Dem, because I actually have strong objections to that other party. Yeah. So that kind of complementary voting pattern has kind of broken down. Yeah, and the nature of a squeeze is such that the more successful you are in squeezing a party, the harder it is to get the last part, yeah. because the people who stay really feel it strongly. So, you know, Lib Dems, even at their lowest point, they were on, what, about 7 8% of the vote? Was it, I think well, it was 8%. Was tw yeah, 20, and 2017, they were down to that sort so of you have level. To assume, so they've got, they are up from 2017. You have to assume that that isn't going to fall any lower, that the absolute core of the Lib Dem vote is around 8%. They're currently on about 11 I think it's, it will go up from that because more people like them than did at their lowest point. So I don't know how much more of the Lib Dem vote there is to squeeze nationally. The question, and I mean, the thing that really is going to determine the whole election, and we said this at the very start yeah. of our artistry, um, <laughs> is <clears throat> was that there are actually around 100 local contests which are going yeah, to decide it, right. and they're all quite set different in their way. And so even when you see these magnificent MRP polls telling you what's going to happen in each seat, even then I think one has to be a bit careful. The truth is that small amounts of success in one constituency or another will make a difference and they will become cumulative. And it's very risky to call it because of that. So I'm just going <clears> to <throat> add to the Tory side, because we haven't talked about it today, mm -hmm. although we have before, beforehand, the UK 
And I'm also going to add a tiny little package on the Lib Dem side, mm -hmm. marked, marked UK, because actually the contest in Scotland, which is quite a lot of seats, yep. it looks like actually saying we don't really want another disruptive referendum on Scottish independence is oddly playing quite well for I the Conservatives and the Lib Dems. And if there's pro-union tactical voting in Scotland, it could hold back the SNP a bit. Yep, I think you're definitely right. And I mean, the reports out of Scotland, one always has to be careful of these, but I was even from somebody, you know, a senior figure in the SNP who was yeah. saying the same thing, that the Tory vote was holding up and it's the Labour vote that's being crushed. Yeah. And that actually, for those people who feel strongly about the union, the Tories still feel like the best bet unless there is a good reason to think the Lib Dems are a more effective challenger. And in a number of the seats held by the Tories, the Brexit party's pulled out, which also helps. Yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> you know, I think it looks like the Tories are not going to have anything like as bad a night in Scotland as, as both of us, I think, would have predicted at, at the very start of the campaign. Now, every time we do these videos, yeah. I get an email from somebody who says we don't speak enough about Northern Ireland. OK, go on then. So, Northern Ireland, it looked very interesting at the start of this campaign because there was some efforts to establish some tactical voting around Brexit there. Absolutely, a sort there of were Remain alliance inside Belfast. Two or three DUP seats that were being aggressively targeted by Remain parties and there was quite a lot of hope, I think, among Remain parties yeah. that the DUP could be pushed out in at least a couple of seats, including the seat held by Nigel Dodds, its leader in Parliament. I was talking to our correspondent who went over there the other day to mm -hmm. look at what was happening, and her view was that actually the DUP is hanging on at the moment. Uh -huh, so, right. so that might give Boris Johnson an option. Tricky after the given... deal basically betrayed the DUP, his Brexit exit, exit deal. But we've discussed before that should there be a hung parliament, Labour has mm -hmm. a lot more options of people it can talk to. The Boris Johnson, if he ends up as the largest party but just shy of a majority. So I want to spring question on you because I've been thinking about this a lot and I don't know look the answer. Look what I've done up here, Robert, look. I really look. like that. That is, <laughs> you know. Will it be Boris on top of the tree? I, um, Will it be Jeremy on top of the tree? Which actually feeds into the question I wanted to okay, ask. Okay. okay, so the line of expectation for this election mm. lies with the Conservatives as the largest party, but possibly short of a majority or possibly with quite a good one. We don't, mm. that, that, it's that valley is, is, is that we're looking into for where we think it's going to land, the landing zone, as it were. Where do you think is the moment where Boris Johnson is out of power? Because if we work on the basis that 320 seats is just about a majority, given all the you know, quirks of the system, how far below that can he fall and actually hang on? I can't see how either the exit deal, as it currently is, survives him falling short and having to go back into discussions with the DUP. Mm. So then you open up the whole first stage of Brexit and then the get Brexit done promise... Yeah, is gone. Is You know, it becomes, you know, morning mist, really. Well, I mean, the only so, way that could happen is yeah. if he agreed to put his deal to a referendum. I, I yeah. can't see how he gets a majority for his deal in Parliament if there is not a Conservative majority. Referendum. On the other hand, I also oh can't yeah. quite see how the Conservative Party bites the bullets on this, unless it just takes the view that it needs to do so to stay in power. I think it's possible for them to attempt to govern with something just short of a majority, trying to do deals on individual policies. Yes. Um, but the but question, I mean, we've, what, had, we've, had, we've had that, though. And, and it's been fun. And it's, been, <laughs> it's been a blast. It's been exhausting for but, everyone. But, I mean, if you, if you tot up their votes, Labour could probably count on the SNP votes for most issues. Um, it can count on Plaid Cymru, it can count on the Greens. Um, the Green. Green, yes. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if, if the Nationalist parties, not any of the Nationalist parties that will turn up win, it will get their support too. Liberal Democrats would probably have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Correct. But... On a lot of Labour policies, their votes would line up with a Labour administration. The question is, at what point it just becomes too rickety to manage? Well, I don't know about a lot, by the way, because somebody, in either of these situations mm. where you haven't got a secure majority, somebody's got to actually have a budget and pass yes. it at some point, and that gets very, very tricky because the Labour package that they'd be putting in a budget is quite hard for other parties to support, I would argue. Yeah, but a budget, but, but, but a budget isn't yeah. something you can negotiate on, you know. I, yeah. I wanted 5p on tax, OK, I'll take four. That, that's where you can have a, a conversation without breaking all principle. And, of course, Boris Johnson has now said he won't be having a budget for quite a long time, so the distress, presumably, of poor old Sajid Javid, who's been wanting to have a budget for quite a long time, and he's finally in number 11. What do you reckon? What is the number of seats at which point Boris Johnson is definitely gone? I think he'd probably hang on down to about 315 with 
though how he'd get Brexit done, I don't know. No. Yeah, I don't. I just. I don't feel in my bones that we're going to be in that kind of territory. But I may be wrong. I may be wrong. I mean, it is. A, it is a shocking thing to think that actually, in three days' time, everything could be very, very clear. Or we could be completely back to where we are. My instinct is that in three days' time, everything will be clear. Well, one way or another. It's going to be very. Uh, but which of these angels will be yeah. above the tree? I don't know. They can't go into coalition themselves. I think. No. No, that's no not grand going to coalitions work. in this that's country. Not going to I don't work. think so. Well, have to see Excellent. festive fun. I very much like your tactical voting spook. Thank you. It's a <laughs> high point of this whole I exercise. I put a lot of effort into that. Yeah. Um, well, next time we do this, we'll yeah. know the answers. That's right. See you back here the other side. Yep.